What's up? Alexander here with Date Psychology. So, today, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about chads and their harems, right? Chad harems, what are those? And how real are they? And importantly, are these chad harems the reason that you are single or not? If you are not, are they pulling women out of the mate pool? Is this something significant that you should be concerned about on a social level. Let's go forward. What are we looking at here? What exactly is this Chad harem, right? How I've seen this described, some people are going to say, you're wrong, you're right, but whatever. It's the belief that there's a small percentage of men that are basically monopolizing the romantic attention, sexual attention of multiple women. So you have what is a sort of de facto polygynous situation, right? You have one man that is concurrently dating multiple women, a bunch of women who are focused on one man, so they're not focused on other men, right? That they presumably would have been in a different kind of environment. Is this real? And how significant is it? Or I should say, how meaningful is this? How much can this account for modern dating struggles, so to speak, right? Because there's a lot of people that really attribute a lot to this, particularly tied into online dating, dating apps. The idea that in modern society, most women are going for the top percentage of men, and as a result of going for that top percentage of men, they're essentially ignoring the rest of the men, right? So we'll go through a bunch of different statistics on that, and let's see what we got here. First, I've asked on social media. I made a post. I said, guys, who's in the Chad harem? Give me an example of a Chad harem. And not much came up. So they seem to be pretty elusive. You don't see a lot of people that are actually living in a situation with multiple women. But a lot of people said the first guy in this chart, who is that? Dan Blazarian, who had a very large influencer social media account from his experiences with women in part, right? The idea that he was basically sort of a modern Hugh Hefner, the second guy, right? The second guy in the chart. And so here we see men that surrounded themselves with women, beautiful women, and they effectively had a harem in that sense, didn't they? They monopolized the attention of these women, uh, but how did they do it? Well, they used money, right? So it's probably not equivalent to what many people describe as a Chad harem on dating apps and that sort of thing, where a man, based on his physical attractiveness, is able to monopolize the attention of multiple women, the top percentage of men. And when you find extremely wealthy people surrounding themselves with women, you do see, okay, many of these women have essentially left the dating pool, haven't they? And you can also find that uh, in other ways that women leave the dating pool to distribute romantic and sexual attention. Sex work would be an example of that, right? Only fans, that sort of a thing as well. And so you will, you, yeah, you will find women who are conventionally attractive, who will, uh, even in cases like Hugh Hefner, marry uh, this individual or be their long-term girlfriends for long, long, you know, his whole life basically, and pull themselves out of the mating pool. So that's something that we do kind of see, a modern day polygyny in that sense. But it's not what most people think of when they think of a Chad harm, when I see it discussed. It, that seems to be something more low level. A lot of people can't point out like, yeah, I know someone that's in a Chad harm, so to speak. Or they'll say, yeah, I know someone who's dating a couple of girls concurrently or whatever. So let's go on to the next slide. So it's probably not a literal harm in most cases, right? It's not typically a man who's living concurrently with multiple women or who is staying with those women exclusively in a relationship, what's much more likely, and I've discussed this in the past and written about it, is that men who are having sex concurrently with multiple women tend to be in that so-called promiscuous 20% of individuals, also called promiscuous 10%. And these are going to be men who have sex with women, but the women are also going to be having sex with other men. So you have basically a pool of people, highly promiscuous, tends to link together and have sex with one another, kind of floating around, and then you have a larger percentage of individuals following a more normal mating pattern, which is essentially serial monogamy. So what do we know that is true, okay? Some men get a lot of female attention, and some men don't get any, right? 
That's just the landscape of romantic relationships. It is what it is. Uh, we see that some men, but relatively few, maintain concurrent sexual partners. You can see this, you know, people discuss these Chad harms and that sort of thing, but you know, you can see it in like uh, polyamorous relationships as well. So it is the case that you can find uh, arrangements and relationships where one man is essentially monopolizing the romantic attention of more than one woman. You see as well things like affairs, people having mistresses, right, which will also pull, pull I should say, an additional woman from the dating pool. And that can kind of contribute to that imbalanced sex ratio, which I'll talk about, that it kind of comes down to. You see the dating app imbalance, which is where I think a lot of this discourse has originated, right? The uh, idea, mostly correct, but not entirely well understood within the discourse, that some men get a lot of attention on dating apps, some men get very little attention on dating apps. So some men have a lot of options on apps, smaller percentage of men, some men get zero matches, and important to understand about dating apps is you see some pretty extreme sex ratios on the app. So even if everyone had a, you know just one-to-one -one match, you would still see about two-thirds of men excluded, given the you know generous ratio that I'm going to uh, state for this, because it can be even larger, but you know about three men to one woman. So that can create the perception of these these Chad harms, so to speak. Even within that, you do see you know the top profiles get disproportionate attention. So that can kind of give the perception of it. But uh, looking at Tinder matches and that sort of thing, it's very limited. I think we will go into that a little bit in this video as well. And then we see the practice of serial monogamy. There's an author, I believe his name is Richard Wright. He's essentially equated serial monogamy to polygyny. And why? He said, well, if you have men who are older, they break up with their girlfriends and they continue to date younger women. They are effectively creating a situation where younger women within the age range of younger men will be pulled from that pool. And we're going to talk a little bit about dating up in age as well, because I think that kind of contributes to why we see in some statistics a, a sort of imbalance within age ranges. So there's a lot going on where some men do, in fact, get more attention from women. Some men get less. So I'm not denying that. Uh, I don't think anyone is denying that. That's a simple fact of romantic relationships, the landscape that we have in front of us. Let's go on now to the next slide. When I was looking at stuff for this video, I had forgotten completely that Chad Harms are, of course, uh, a genre of anime, right? And I don't watch these very much, but so I had forgotten about it. But yeah, you will see a guy who essentially is attractive to women for whatever reason. We got a big buff guy in this, this one, which was kind of funny, but a lot of the time it's like a little nerdy guy and whatever. These are probably fantasies of, of the authors that write these animes or these mangas or whatever. And I think that is actually pretty close kind of to the way that people imagine Chad Harms. I wonder how much anime has influenced the, the perception of that as well. We have a lot of anime fans that kind of overlap. But I think that's kind of a good model where we have a guy that's basically getting a lot of attention from women, okay? Let's go on now to the next one. Why does it matter? What is the general idea here? Why, do, why should we even care? Why is it important? So the perceived consequences here. We have at least in you know Western society, mostly a one-to-one -one sex ratio. That's not the case in some countries. I believe Qatar has a big sex ratio. I think Kuwait does, where even if every man had one woman, you would be left with a lot of men. Why? Because there's simply more men. But in Western culture, we have a pretty close one-to-one -one sex ratio. And that means that if one man has two girlfriends, there's a woman that's pulled from the pool, basically not available for another man. Uh, I don't want to act like women are like a, a resource that should actually be distributed equally across all men or whatever the case may be, it's sort of like a sexual communism, but that is a description, you know, kind of mathematically of, of what happens. If you have someone that has two girlfriends, four wives, whatever the case may be, it takes women out of the pool. There's a lot of discussion on in Western history, past human history. Would this have caused social instability? Did enforced monogamy arise to offset that and make sure that everyone was like uh, kind of cool, like, okay, everyone gets, gets a spouse, basically. And this kind of comes down to a situation where it's kind of like, okay, Chad essentially stole 
the girl that would have been my girlfriend, right? Chad stole my would-be girlfriend. And the conditions of modern society, particularly dating apps or whatever, have allowed that to come into being. So that's kind of the idea uh, behind these Chad harms and behind the discourse that acts like they're a sort of social problem in a sense. Let's go forward. Given that, not much more discussion goes beyond that. Uh, there's a lot of questions that should be answered that aren't because it's, you know, we've seen Hugh Hefner, right? Dan Blazerian. We know that actual harms exist, but if they're very, very few, they're probably not a good explanation for dating woes, right? They're probably not a big, big cause of why we see a lot of single men, particularly single young men. Uh, it's probably not the reason in that case, if they are a tiny percentage of relationships similar to polyamorous relationships that they are pulling women from the pool so we want to ask how many of these harms exist i'm going to tell you right now there's not really like data on that so it's not going to be a question that i'm going to be able to just give you a number for in this video but there's good reason to believe it's kind of kind of small and uh, we will go through some data on that uh, we want to ask as well has this relationship pattern increased and this is important because People associate the formation of these Chad harms, right, with dating apps. The idea that, okay, dating apps allow all of the women to access a small tier of men. And so we should expect uh, data that would be consistent with the existence of, you know, a top 10% of men, top 20%, 5% of men showing, okay, these men are having much more sex now than they did before apps. And we will look at some data on that. We want to see basically if this relationship pattern, the Chad harm, has truly increased. Uh, we want to know as well, is this a large enough phenomenon, right, to be concerned about, as I mentioned, and can it explain really any meaningful portion of singledom? Let's go on. Important to understand right off the bat, what takes people out of the dating pool, right? Where do the men or the women go that you could have dated but you can't because they're no longer available. Maybe they all went to Chad, right? Maybe there's 100 women with some guy. And so there's 99 women that if he did not monopolize all of the women, you would totally certainly have a girlfriend. But that doesn't seem to be where most of the men or the women go. Uh, a large percentage of women, we're going to focus on young women in the 18 to 29 age range based on some recent Pew data, which is where the numbers are from here. Uh, they simply don't want to date. So they've removed themselves from the dating pool. They're not being monopolized by one man. Committed relationships are the biggest explanation for pulling people from the dating pool, okay? 34% of women were single in this data, which means that the remaining 66% of women responded, yes, I am in a committed relationship. So what does that mean, committed relationship? We will get into that, but certainly I think if you said that at face value, it would indicate some kind of dating serial monogamy situation. And in the same age range of the women who remain single, of that 34%, 37% are not looking to date at all. So you have people already, most women are pulled from the dating pool because they're dating someone else. Most women are pulled, or excuse me, most of the, not, not even most, but about 40%, 37% of the women who are single, they're not trying to date anyone at all. Let's look at the next slide here. So we should ask right away, is this explained by Chad Harms? We have, you know, the graph from this Pew data that is becoming sort of a meme, and it shows that 63% of men report not being in a committed relationship between 18 and 29, 34% of women do, how do you explain something like that? Well, it could be that they perceive the same relationship differently, right? You have uh, women who are in a situation with a man and they say, this is totally a committed relationship. And the men say, you know, I'm not in a committed relationship, okay? That's not a very plausible explanation if you ask people, are you in a committed relationship? If you ask the question like, are you single? Are you involved with someone? Something like that, yeah, right? You could see how you might get different numbers. People could interpret that differently, but a committed relationship, pretty specific question. So I don't find that especially plausible that people don't know kind of the status of their own relationship or what it really is. It's kind of a conversation people have. Um, 
so this is used as well occasionally to say, okay, well, that's because you know a lot of those women are sharing the same men. Maybe, but it's probably not the case. The best explanation for this is if you look at an age range, 18 to 29, any age range, you have to remember that women date up on average. The average age that women date up is something like two to four years. It's not a very large age range, but that's the average. If you look at the whole distribution, it actually pulls a lot of people from that pool. So let's go forward and look at this. This is some of my data that I took from the US Census, the current population study. And it's age gap data for marriages. And there's not a lot of other age gap data. So I used this to begin an estimate, okay? If we look at the percentage of women dating outside of the 18 to 29 age range, so for example, what percentage of women who are 18 who are dating someone who's 30? What percentage of women who are 22 who are dating someone who's 30? And you go down, you can see that this pulls about 12.6% from that group. So that already explains a big percentage of the missing women, of the disparity, but not all of it, right? At the same time, that's probably a low estimate because these are uh, estimates for marriages, right? They don't just apply to relationship, who is dating who, you know, and it gets uh, wider as you go. An Ipsos poll, I didn't put that here, put about 28% of women who have been in an age gap of 10 years or more. So in that case, you can see how it goes up, right? Because if it's 20% of women, 10 years or more, you know, you don't need a 10 year age gap if you're 25 to be pulled out of that pool, right? So to consider even further, we see, and we'll look at this in the next slide, that singledom among young men is concentrated in 18 to 24, right? They present these statistics as 18 to 29, but if you look at the distribution, it's not the 25 to 29 age group that has all of the singles. It's pretty much the 18 to 24 age range. And you can see within that group, right, the gap is smaller. You don't need big 10-year gaps, and that pulls even more people out of the dating pool. So about 40%, 48%, excuse me, of women between age 18 and 24 are dating someone who is actually older than 24. So already, if you are a man who is between 18 and 24, pretty close to half of the women who are like your age, they're gone, you know, in that pool. Let's look at the next slide. This shows singles in the GSS 2021 that I already had prepared, and I didn't look for 2022 yet, but we'll look at some 2022 data that's more recent, okay? But we can see the effect here, that this is driven by the youngest individuals. I broke it into 18 and 24, 25 through 29. 18 to 24, 76% of the young men are single. Ages 25 to 29, what percent is that on there? 47%. So it almost, you know, halves in that sense. And I didn't put women up here, but if you look at the same age range, 25 to 29, it's pretty close as well. I think it was about 50 something percent of women. So you see that it kind of closes quickly. This is something that's driven by the youngest adults. It's not even driven by the late 20s in that case. In other words, it's not something that persists. A lot of the men who are in a difficult situation when they're young, dating, and they can't find someone, they're going to get out of that, you know, when they hit their mid-20s, which, you know, good news, I guess. Let's go on to the next slide here. What do we learn from this? Age gaps. They pull women from the dating pool, kind of like Robert Wright said in his book, right? But that's not because of a Chad Harm type of situation. That's simply dating up in age. You know, if you do that, there's not going to be enough people left within your own age range. So not a criticism of age gap relationships one way or the other. I'm not telling you it's good or bad. I'm simply telling you that this is the landscape, okay? Even small average age gaps, as I described, they can hit that 18 to 25 demographic really, really hard. This is not a new phenomenon. It's not driven by modern modernity, right, or dating apps or whatever. Age gaps have always existed. Uh, in fact, age gaps are pretty similar now to what they were in the 1500s. And I've done some videos looking at age gaps and, and that in the past. They've always been pretty modest in Western society, but women have always dated older men, and this has always left a population of young single men. And that young single population at times has gotten into trouble and done things, you know, the idea of like 
relationships being protective against crime, antisocial behavior, particularly in the young. Yeah, it's all tied in there. But again, it's not the case that this is multiple, or excuse me, one man monopolizing multiple women. This is older men pulling younger women from the dating pool. Monogamy will do this. You don't need Chad Harms to explain it. Let's look here at the next one. So I mentioned committed relationships, okay, in the Pew poll, and they ask a similar question in the GSS, you know, committed relationship. It could be that people misreport what it means to be in a committed relationship. So we can kind of look at the chart here and see if that might be the case. This is the percentage of men and women that reported that they were the last time they had sex was within a committed relationship. And here we see that it's actually much, much more similar, right? We might see disagreement in individuals as to who is in a committed relationship or not. But if we did, we might also expect that people who are having sex would report that differently, right? We should see that reflected in the data, which we don't. You know, if men and women are in a situationship, they're having sex, but one of them says it's not in a committed relationship, the other says it is, then you will see a statistic similar to the Pew results, right? Where you have, you know, twice as many men report being single. Why? Because some portion of those men are not uh, sexually inactive, but they're having sex with other people, right? Not what we see. 85% uh, of men, 78% of women said that they did have sex within a committed relationship. That's uh, their sexual partner, right? 21% of men, 15% of women said that the last time they had sex was not in a committed relationship. So again, we're kind of seeing, you know, again, the promiscuous 10%, excuse me, promiscuous 20% in this case, right? That there is a similar portion of the population, both for men and women, that are having casual sex, basically. But most people are having sex within the context of a committed relationship, and we see that men and women report that equally. So, again, that's consistent with a better explanation for the discrepancy in reporting who is in a committed relationship uh, being due to age rather than being due to disagreement of what it means to be in a committed relationship or, you know, some kind of uh, situation where men are, you know, a small percentage of men are monopolizing all of the sex. What else do we see here? Okay, committed relationships. This is broken further by age. And this is interesting because we do see uh, a sex difference for the youngest group again, right? That men who were sexually active, young, were much less likely to report that they had sex in a committed relationship. But between 25 and 35, you begin to see it equal out, okay? So probably also the case here that, I don't know, you have to ask yourself, is it like young chads, right? Is Are the chads 18 years old? Probably not what you would think of typically and probably not what we know as far as male attractiveness, who is attractive and that sort of thing. Men in that age range often are not what women are seeking either for short-term encounters or for long-term encounters. So this is, you know, the percentage of men that had sex. So we do see a difference here. And maybe you could look at that and say, okay, well, that could be consistent with with the, the Chad Harm thing, right? That women in that, but remember, women are dating up as well. So you would actually expect the 18 to 24 group of women to be kind of similar to the 25 to 30 of men, which is what we see as well. But there's the data. Interpret it as you will. Let's look at this as well, because tied into this Chad Harm idea is, right, the so-called 80-20 rule, which is kind of based on the Pareto principle, right? The idea that in any given domain, 20% of uh, individuals are kind of responsible for most production, typically in economic contexts. We see it applied in sexual contexts. We've seen it kind of in uh, dating app matches as well, haven't we? Swipes, that sort of thing, that 20% of the men outperform. But it's not something that we see in sexual behavior. Here we have the most recent GSS data from 2022. What do we see? A very similar distribution of number of sexual partners within the last year for men and for women. So it's not the case, for example, that the top 20% uh, of men, 10% of men, whatever the case may be, are having all of the sex, the others are not. It's pretty similar for men and women. Let's look at the next one. These are some charts from a friend of mine on, on Twitter. I put his 
handle down there, you guys should follow him. His name is Nuance Enjoyer. Uh, they call it X now instead of Twitter, but whatever. Uh, the top 20%, the idea that dating apps have kind of facilitated this increase, which people call hypergamy, which is, I guess I should digress for a second and say it's not necessarily hypergamy, which is a selection up, right? Because individuals can be promiscuous and still be a hypogamous selection. It's not the case that uh, simply having sex with someone means that someone is selecting up, but people call it that, so we're going to kind of look at it that way. We're going to call it this top 20%. Has hypergamy increased? Well, if that was the case, what we could do is we could look at the top 5% of men, right? And we could look at the top 20% of men. And what would we expect? As specifically, you know, if this is something that has increased with dating app use, right? That dating apps have facilitated hypergamy and they facilitated these chad harms. They facilitated more sexual activity for a smaller group of men within the top 20% or the top 5%. If that's the case, we should see the top 20% of individuals reporting sexual activity, reporting more over time, specifically after a time when dating apps were introduced. I would expect to see that from about 2012 onward. In fact, that's not the trend that we see. The top 20% of men sexually active are, in fact, pretty stable between 2008 and 2022. This is from the General Social Survey across all of these different years. And the top 5% of men, less sex, which is also consistent with a trend of younger individuals having less sex. The first one is for all men. The second chart is for men between ages 18 and 29. We kind of see a similar trend that even the most promiscuous individuals, men, have had less sex now than they were in the past. Pretty contrary to this idea, right, that uh, hypergamy has increased, that the top men are having more sex, but that the bottom 80% of men are perhaps not. Here's another chart, and this shows lifetime sexual partners for the top 20 and 5% men from a different data set that's much larger, okay? This is from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which is a much larger representative data set, about 6,000 people. Similar trend here, we don't see number of lifetime sexual partners increasing. It's remained pretty stable over time. You know, even following that, uh, you know, about 2012, it kind of isn't as much on this chart. Kind of following that point where we would expect it to go up, we see a small decline. Let's look at the next chart. So, this shows dating app statistics from the National Survey of Family Growth. A lot of people focus on matches, as I said, and matches are very limited because we know, for example, there's already a big sex difference imbalance on dating apps, so we can't expect an equal number of matches. We know that men and women use different swiping strategies, right? Men will swipe on anything, whatever the case may be. We see some big differences in match outcomes and swiping behavior, but that's all it can tell you. It can't tell you who's meeting, it can't tell you who's having sex, and that sort of a thing. But if it was a small percentage of men monopolizing all of the women, and a lot of women who were having sex with those men, well, we would expect, at least for heterosexual women, a high percentage to report of dating app users that they had sex with someone from a dating app, and a low percentage of men. What do we see? 8.6% of men reported that they had sex with someone they met on a dating app in the past year, 7.4% of women reported that they had sex with someone they met on a dating app within the past year. So it's actually the case that when you look at sexual behavior meetups from dating apps, stemming from dating apps, that men and women are pretty much on par. Gay men, much higher, as you can see in this, okay? When you look at gay men, gay women, that sort of a thing, then you begin to see, yeah, big differences in, in, in sexual behavior due to sex differences in sexual behavior, right? In the willingness to be promiscuous, libido, uh, all of those, you know, sociosexuality, whatever. You can go down the list. You know, the ability to orgasm and enjoy a sexual experience, all of that. But we don't see that with men and women. So what's probably going on here is that regardless of how many matches or whatever you might get, a lot of people are simply not meeting up. They're not having sex. And of the people that do get matches and meet up, um, they're probably meeting up kind of within the same pool of individuals, perhaps more desirable individuals for who dating apps actually seem to work well. And you're still getting that kind of one-to-one -one ratio where, 
you know, for every man who has sex with a woman, there's a woman who has sex with another man. It kind of balances out. It's not all of the women having sex with one man. I think this kind of throws people because they would, you know, there is kind of that narrative that men will like massively select down. And I think when you look at matches, it kind of drives that perception. Why? Because men swipe on everything, right? So you get a bunch of matches. That doesn't mean you're going on dates with all of those people, guys. You know, it, it, just because you get a lot of matches, you're not going to like a lot of the people you talk to. They're not going to like you all of the time. You're going to go on some dates. A lot of them are going to fizzle out. And of course, your experience in that case is going to be very different from someone who gets no matches, right? But that doesn't mean that you're going to have sex with everything that moves either. Last slide here. What have we learned from this? Okay. Probably not a lot of evidence as far as the data in the statistics show for, for Chad Harms. They probably don't make a very large portion of the landscape. Okay. We see these disparities in singledom among young individuals. They seem to be driven more by monogamous relationships, probably by age gaps, by people selecting up, explains a lot of it. Okay. A lot can create kind of this imbalance in the dating market, the ratios of men to women. But the monopolization of women by a select group of men, it's probably pretty low on the list. I don't think it can account for very much, right? It's not the case that, uh, you know, every Chad has a thousand girlfriends and they would totally be dating all of the other men if they only lived in, you know, a different kind of situation where they didn't have access to those men. I think something people probably guess wrongly an inaccurate mental map of the landscape is this idea that uh, attractive men are actually going to kind of entertain all of these less attractive women and you have little experiments people have done online and made memes out of like look I uploaded this woman that was photoshopped to look like a pig and she got a thousand matches and it's like okay she got a thousand matches but how many people simply swiped you know how many people will send a message but would never meet her how many people would never have sex with it. You know, those are kind of the questions that you have to ask. Simply looking at like, oh, but they get a lot of matches and I don't. That's not really as informative, right? That can be very, very misleading. I think people are underestimating the extent to which people shoot for attractive individuals. And when you have both men and women who are shooting upwards, who are selecting upwards for attractive individuals, you get people who are left out, both men and women, okay? And you find that those people get together and they like each other, right? And they stay together, you know? They form relationships that last for a little bit of time, serially monogamous. They're not necessarily accumulating quantity over quality in that sense, right? A lot of men would rather simply have a nice girlfriend who is their looks match, especially, you know, a conventionally attractive man. Uh, there's a lot of competition for attractive women, you know, so there's a lot of incentive to kind of commit in that sense as well. And it's kind of like, okay, do you want to, uh, you know, have casual sex with, with a lot of threes or do you want to have a relationship and get into the relationship? Most people have a pretty strong orientation for and desire for monogamy, for wanting to actually get into a relationship. So I think that probably pulls more people from the dating pool than people tend to think. It's not the case that everyone is out there uh, desiring to be a PUA bachelor and simply have sex with as many people as possible. And that's about it for this. Hope you learned some things. Like, subscribe, hit the bell. I will make another video for you very soon.